All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. Luke chapter number 4. I'm going to get back into the Gospel of Luke this morning and uh, pick up there in the life of Jesus. As Luke describes to us these accounts of Jesus' life as an attempt to um, uh, help persuade us that what we have heard of Jesus uh, and what is recorded for us in the Bible is true and accurate. And uh, I know you say, well, it, it, it is the Bible in Luke, so a lot of good that does us. Well, uh, we have to take it in its context and understand uh, that Luke was writing this as an individual to an individual, um, and uh, it's been passed down to us and uh, does serve as great evidence and corresponds with the, uh, the, the veracity of Scripture. So Luke chapter 4, beginning there in verse 31, and I'll read down through the end of the chapter in verse 44. The Bible says here, And he, referring to Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us that uh, I know who you are? You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed, and said one to another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and went, uh, left the synagogue and entered to Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on, their, on her behalf and stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought, him to him, brought them rather to him and laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose." And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for this chance to stand and to uh, preach the word of God. And uh, Lord, the opportunity to, to listen to it being preached. And uh, Lord, uh, we, we uh, uh, just as much today as any time and point in history, uh, need to be convinced of who uh, Jesus was, who Jesus is, and what Jesus wants to uh, accomplish Uh, in our lives. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone that is listening, whether um, uh, in person or online, or will uh, come back and watch later, Lord, that uh, just isn't convinced uh, that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, uh, can do what he said he could do. Father, that today, uh, through this message, through this time together, uh, Lord, that you'd convince us of the truth of of, uh, of your, your identity, and uh, Lord, what you desire to do for us. For us in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. One of the most difficult challenges of life is getting to know somebody. Uh, as you uh, could see in the bulletin, uh, Camille and I moved in uh, to our, our home here in Candler uh, one year ago today. And uh, in some ways, it feels like we've been here 20 years, and sometimes it feels like 20 minutes. Um, and uh, so getting to know people is difficult, and it's especially been difficult in this midst of uh, coronavirus and having all these uh, interesting things that have happened in life. And so I asked the question, uh, after a year, do you think you know me very well? Uh, you might would say yes, you might would say no, and uh, but we're going to find out. Uh, maybe No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give you a quiz to see if you know me, uh, but I just want you to think about that. How do you get to know a person? Uh, is, it, is it by being around them uh, a few hours a week over the course of a year, over the course of 10 years, 15, 20 years, uh, or do you really have to uh, be with a person uh, in, in all kinds of circumstances in life? to truly get to know them. 
to not just see them on their high points or on the, the highlights of their life, but to be with them in the ordinary times, the difficult times, the dark times, the frustrating times, and the times when life is going completely wrong that you get to know a person. I, I think we could all say in agreement that you don't really know a person until you see them in challenging times and when you see them in ordinary times when they're not trying to put up a front, where they're not trying to portray uh, a certain personality trait, that you really get to understand who they are. And, and I think it's important for us as believers and those who might be questioning the faith and interacting with the scriptures uh, to really get to know Jesus, not just in the highlights. Uh, if I were to ask, the majority of people uh, in our community uh, that knows anything about Jesus, there are certain things they're going to be able to tell us. They'll know that Jesus was born there in Nazareth around Christmas time, and uh, we celebrate him being born in a manger. Uh, they know the cruel death that he suffered on the cross of Calvary. They may not understand all the implications of that. They understand that we claim that he rose again from the third on the third day, and we celebrate that at Easter time. Uh, but, but I don't think we really know Jesus and what Jesus wants to do in just those highlight times. I think we see in the ordinary events of his life, although they're not ordinary to us, that we really get to understand who Jesus is. And so as we look at Luke chapter 4, there, there, there's three events here in verses 31 through 44 that we can kind of... Uh, take as an overview, uh, there are some specifics we won't be able to get into, uh, but take as an overview to introduce us to who Jesus is and how Jesus will conduct himself in his ministry. And these things, of course, will help us as we look through the rest of Luke's gospel uh, together, as you may read it on your own or as we'll study it together here. Uh, so it serves as an overview uh, of helping us understand who Jesus is and why he did the things that he did and how he did them. So Luke's writing, as I've already mentioned, to help convince us that what we've heard about Jesus is true and it's accurate. We can believe it. We can place our faith there. He has shown us in Luke chapter number 4 already uh, that in his own hometown of Nazareth that he was rejected because he wouldn't do the things they wanted him to do and perform the miracles and the things that he claimed. They, they despised that and said, no, we don't want anything to do with you. In fact, we'd rather kill you. Uh, than to have you go on sharing these things or, or acting this way around us. And those were people that should have been the first to accept Jesus. And Luke contrasts that with these people in Capernaum. These are not Jewish people. They have not grown up with the religious heritage, the knowledge that a Messiah was coming, the knowledge that they have something to look forward to. And Luke contrasts that, man, they were excited to have Jesus come in and help them. They were ecstatic that there was a, a man like Jesus who could come and help them. And so he, he describes here three events that happen in Jesus' life uh, very early on in his ministry that I believe will help us learn to know Jesus beyond just the highlights of what we all know to be true. And the first thing that I want you to see from this text is that Jesus' life and his day-to-day -day ordinary events was marked by authority under control. Marked by authority in control. I want to draw your attention to where we see this in the passage. You'll look there in verse 32. He comes in and he's teaching them on the Sabbath. Verse 32 says, And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Now I want to stop right there. Ordinarily, when somebody got up and doing what I'm doing today, in, in preaching and proclaiming the scripture, it would be a, a little different than how we experience it today. Um, uh, it, it would be uh, more of a, uh, a lecture, if you will. And sometimes you may say, well, Brother Daniel, that's all you do is lecture. So I try to put a little bit more uh, emphasis into that and not be so monotone all the time. But it does happen from time to time. But the teacher would get up and would be careful to make sure that as he's teaching, he would, uh, a reference, if you will, that he would cite all of the sources that he was using to argue the things that he was going to argue, okay? So for me, it would be like me saying, okay, I read this and this commentary or this author said this exactly, and spelling out every single name in every single instance that I'm using other people's advice or, or suggestions and that was how it went. The reason you did that was to say, hey, I'm not just drawing this out of thin air. I have some concrete evidence for why I'm saying the things that I'm saying. 
But when Jesus went into the temple, he, he didn't do that. He didn't rely on rabbis that had come before him. He didn't rely on teachers that they may have known that could have verified his own authority. No, he simply spoke from his own authority. Why is that? That's, he is Jesus. He is the Word. Uh, he is the divine authority. And so we see that. But we also see his authority that he possessed over these demons. As he begins to teach a man in the crowd that is possessed with a demon, and hopefully this won't happen here this morning, uh, because I'd be scared to death, just to be honest with you, but I'm not Jesus, so that probably explains that a little bit. A demon starts shouting him down, saying, well, Jesus, what are you going to do with us? We, we know who you are. We know you're the Son of God. Have you come to destroy us? And Jesus very calmly rebukes that demon and says, hey, get out of him. Quit causing him harm. Come out and be quiet. And we see this demon pitches a fit, but he does exactly what Jesus told him to do. Then you skip down to the next story, where Jesus has been invited into the home of who we know to be Simon Peter. His mother-in-law is there sick with a fever, and the Bible says that Jesus rebuked the same exact word that he did with the demon uh, the same attitude, the same action. He rebuked the fever to come out of this lady. And without any hesitation, without any argument, without any hesitation, the fever leaves this woman and Jesus shows his authority over disease. He's going to show that again as he heals in just the, the bottom few verses there and demons come out of them. And it is all a picture of that this is the supreme being of the universe. This is the all-powerful being. But I want you to just think about how under control it was. One of the hobbies in the very beginning of the coronavirus that Camille and I took up because at that point, you know, we were... Uh, unsure of what was going to happen. Uh, I tried to stay home as much as possible, uh, but if you know me, that, that doesn't work out very well. And so we tried to pick up watching some movies, okay? And uh, we had never seen the Marvel line of movies, if you've ever seen those. If you haven't, uh, go home and watch them maybe this afternoon if you're bored. Uh, if not, that's okay. Uh, but have you ever heard of Iron Man? Nod your head if you have. Okay, some of you have, some of you haven't. Iron Man is uh, is a... Uh, is, uh, one of the better ones that I watched, and it's interesting that he creates this suit that is supposed to give him all these superpowers. But the problem is, at first, he didn't know how to control it. So there he is in his laboratory where he has created this grand design of a suit that is going to save the world, but yet he can't even stop himself from destroying everything in his own house and hurting himself. Why? Because he wasn't able to control it. But when we see Jesus, the supreme being of the universe, that's not what we see. In fact, we see a very controlled spirit to where there was probably a lot of things Jesus could do that Jesus did not do. And because of that, I do think there are some, maybe of us, or, or at least some in our culture, I know some in Jesus' day, and, I, and we read about them throughout history, that kind of... Uh, get stumped on the fact that Jesus did not cure everything he could have cured. He didn't cast out every single demon that was in the land that day. He didn't raise every single person that died while he was on earth to life again so that they could be re reunited with their family. He didn't take away every single ailment that everybody had while he was there on earth. And still to this day, we understand that we are still living under the curse of disease and sickness and possibly, probably even some demon possession and, and demon influence. And as we, we struggle with this question of who Jesus is, we come to this spot in, in life where we must ask, well, why didn't Jesus just cure everything that had ever caused any issues and we would be living in peace and happiness right now? We wouldn't deal with all the problems that we have and all the sad situations that we see in praying for the young lady with the tumor that Miss Kelly mentioned. Man, it's so sad. And it would just seem like to us that if we had the control, that we would just snap our fingers and all of that would be done away with. Can I tell you that I, I don't have the answer on why God chooses to heal some and not others? 
I don't have the answer of why God would cast some demons out, allow some to continue to suffer with that, or why God would raise Lazarus from the dead. But then there was other uh, people that I'm sure he loved and cared about that we don't even know their names yet. He did not do that for them. I don't know the answer to that. But I know the framework is, is that his authority was under control. That, that he had a purpose and a plan for life. He was here on a mission, as we'll get to in just a moment. And the truth of the matter is, is that if Jesus had cured all of their issues and dealt with all of their troubles, at some point they would not realize just how much they needed Him as Savior. And if you and I did not face troubles today, we would be in the exact same situation. Where we would not, life would be just too good, where we would not realize our need for a Messiah. And so we see Jesus... His life and ministry is going to be marked by authority under control. He was, he, he was very disciplined in how he performed his miracles and the things that he chose to do. But I also want you to understand that Jesus' life and ministry to this day is marked by compassion for the weak. Marked by compassion for the weak. Let me draw your attention back to this situation with the demon-possessed man. Verse 33 simply describes it. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But verse 35 says, But Jesus rebuked him, saying. Now ask yourself this question. Who did Jesus rebuke? Was it the demon or was it the man that was possessed by the demon? And I think the answer is that Jesus rebuked the demon and not the man who had been possessed by the demon. Why? Because his compassion for the weak and frail human flesh that you and I are clothed in today. Jesus never excused sin. Jesus did not say that this man had no culpability in his current condition. But all of his anger, as we'll see in, in just a few moments, was directed at the demon and not the man possessed by the demon. So let's skip down to the healing of uh, Simon's mother-in-law. If you look there in verse 38. And he rose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. And now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And notice what it's, what, how verse 39 puts it. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Now ask yourself this question. Now I'm asking a lot of questions today. It's not because I don't have answers, okay? I want you to help me come to these answers. Why did Jesus rebuke the fever? The same terminology is used for the demon as the fever. Could it be that Jesus understood and knows that it is a result of sin, a result of living in a fallen world that you and I have to deal with sickness, that you and I have to deal with disease? And as he's looking at this frail, precious lady that is laying in this bed that he created, that he loves, that he is going to the cross to die for, that he looks at her and has some compassion on her because of her current condition and the state that she's in. Then you go on to look as Jesus begins to heal all of these people. We don't know their names. We don't know the, their conditions. We don't know how bad it was or we don't even know uh, what, what the outcome of it was. But we go on in Jesus' life to understand this. You think about Mary and Martha and Lazarus when Lazarus had passed away. And his siblings are, are heartbroken over the fact that their loved one has died. And the, and the Bible says that Jesus was moved to tears. Now we could get into an argument about why Jesus cried. It may be their lack of faith. Maybe he was disappointed in their lack of belief that even four days later Jesus could heal them. Or could it just simply be that Jesus was moved to compassion over the, 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 the grief that they were experiencing and felt for them in their frail, weak human condition? Think about another time in Jesus' life as a processional, funeral processional is making their way past him. And there's a, a, a widow lady who has already lost her husband and now her only son is, is for all intents and purposes in our modern day languages laying there in the casket. And the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion. He had no other purpose 
to heal and raise this young man from the dead than simply a heart of compassion for his mother who had already lost her husband. That is who Jesus is. We don't see Jesus as a evil dictator in heaven that is looking out for how he can control and destroy and manipulate our lives and just make things miserable for us. That God is not a, a God in heaven that is just looking for ways to steal all the joy out of life that we have here on earth. And he's certainly not in heaven uh, getting joy and, and glee out of condemning people to hell because of their unbelief and being separated from them for all of eternity. That is not the God we serve. We serve a God, as Psalm 103 reminds us, that he remembers that we are but dust. He knows what we are made of. He knows our weaknesses. He knows the struggles and the temptations that we endure. And He knows how difficult this life is and the struggles that we have. And sure, Jesus exercised His authority under control, but I believe it was often motivated by the compassion that He has for you and I. But I also believe we see in this passage that it was marked by the animosity that He has towards evil so as you look at jesus life and we've already kind of made mention to these throughout uh this this uh, passage of scripture but just thinking about his interaction here with this demon that has said hey uh, what are you to what are you here to do with us we know we know who you are uh, we know you're going to destroy us but can we uh, have just a few more minutes of enjoyment of tormenting this man in his life and the bible says that he rebuked him in, in other words this is a, a strong armed command that hey, your time of fun is over, come out of him and let him get back to his life and, and be at peace and, uh, and, and be able to enjoy his life once again. Obviously, we see that in the rebuke for the fever and, and the rebuke for the demons later. And Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is compassionate. In every interaction we see, other than with evil spirits, other than with diseases, and other than the self-righteous Pharisees who were putting too hard of a, uh, of a burden on those that they were leading. Every time you see Jesus interacting with sin, every time you see Jesus interacting with false teaching, He is stern. Why is Jesus so stern in those interactions? Because He hates evil. Because it is opposed to everything that he stands for. It is against his nature. It is against his design. And because he knows how dangerous it is for you and I. Jesus does not hate those that sin. Jesus does not, in, in scriptural evidence, get angry towards those who sin. He gets angry at our sin. Let me illustrate it to you this way. If your child, as they were growing up, let's just uh, imagine uh, 12, 13 years old, um, were influenced by an adult that you know to pick up some kind of bad habit that, that, that was wrong, it was obviously bad, they shouldn't be doing it, it was obviously going to cause them some problems in life. As a parent, who is your anger directed at? Sure, there's probably some anger because we're not Jesus at our children for falling into that. But there is a special kind of anger that would re be reserved for the adult in the situation who should have known better, who should have had a little bit of more self-control or, or used a little bit more wisdom not to lead that child into doing something they shouldn't have done. And I believe that's what we see here in Jesus' interaction with this demon, in inter Jesus' interaction with the disease, is a, a clear animosity towards evil because he knows that sin does not bring joy. It kills joy. Sin does not bring peace. It kills peace. Sin does not bring fulfillment. It makes fulfillment po impossible to achieve. And he understands our, the difficulties that are there. So as we look at Jesus' life, trying to, again, getting an overview and we'll dive more deeper into uh, details later on about these miracles, not these specifically, but others. We see that it's marked by authority that is completely under control. Compassion for those that are weak, and that would include us. His animosity towards evil, but we have to 
we have to nail down this last mark here, and that is that he was marked by his mission to save. This is what helps explain, I believe, why he did not cure all of our problems and why he has compassion and why he hates evil. I want you to look at what happens in verse 42. The Bible says here, And when it was day, he departed and went into a, a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. Now notice what he says, For I was sent here for this purpose. Now, this is in direct contrast with the people of Nazareth. They kicked him out. In fact, they tried to kill him. We know he escaped from that. But here are the people of Capernaum. Well, they're saying, hey, we, we like this Jesus guy. Sure is a lot cheaper than these doctors we've been visiting. It sure is a lot more effective. It sure is a lot more satisfying to see instantly our loved ones get healed and just hypothetically they were to say well what if Jesus leaves today and tomorrow my loved one is stricken with this fever and I can't go get Jesus to bring him back to heal the disease what if in two weeks from now, after Jesus is gone, my, my loved one is possessed with a demon and they're, they're hurting themselves, they're harming themselves, and I can't find Jesus? No, we need Jesus to stay here. Let him settle down here and just make our lives great. That's what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to just stay with them so that they could enjoy Jesus, Jesus could enjoy them, and their lives would be great. But why didn't Jesus do that? Because there was an entire world of people that needed the same thing the people of Capernaum needed. There was a, an entire group of people that needed his teaching, his authority, his deliverance, his help and hope that he could provide for them. You see, Jesus was not there to simply perform miracles. He was there to offer deliverance. He was not there to make their lives better here on earth. He was there to give them a better hope for eternity. And all throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout all the distractions, throughout all the temptations, throughout all the questions, throughout all the people begging Him to focus on the here and now, He said, no, I'm preparing for eternity. He never came to make this life great. He came here to make the next life perfect. He never came to heal us of our symptoms he came here to heal us of our disease i'll illustrate it to you this way you know as well as i do that we have a a a, a problem here in western north carolina specifically in Asheville, buncombe county with homelessness it is sad to see the amount of people that are living here in 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 a in a homeless condition and i've spent a lot of time thinking about what can be done to, to fix this issue? And you see a lot of good things happening. You see people providing uh, blankets to people that are, that are in a homeless situation. And, and man, most certainly that's needed. You know, we don't want them, if they're going to have to sleep outside, to sleep outside without any kind of uh, covering and warmth. You see people giving some money, give people giving some... Uh, water bottles. We have some hotels and, and homeless shelters within our city that are, are designed specifically to provide a place for them to stay. But it hasn't fixed the problem. In order to fix the problem, really, an individual, if they don't know Jesus, they need to meet Jesus. But more than likely, there's some addiction problems that have to be dealt with in order to cure the homelessness. More than likely, there's some financial decisions that have been made throughout their lives that are going to have to be addressed in order to cure their homelessness. 
more than likely there's going to have to be a network of people that are going to come around them that will love them and care for them and, uh, and help them and motivate them and provide for them and encourage them in order to cure their homelessness. More than likely there's going to have to be some uh, job training that takes place that uh, introduces them to a line of work and people that would be willing to take a chance to give this individual a work in order to cure their homelessness. Maybe have to teach some life skills on how to to, to bathe and to clothe themselves again and how to cook their own meals and to provide for themselves and to live under a sustainable new life from the one that they have grown used to. Now do you see why homelessness isn't cured? Because it is a big problem that has multiple levels of difficulty. And what the people of Capernaum wanted Jesus to do was, hey, toss me a blanket. Hey, toss me a bottle of water. Hey, toss me a few, big, a few bucks to let me go get a Happy Meal today or, or a Big Mac Meal, whatever you eat from McDonald's. But what Jesus said is, no, I, I would rather go through the depths of everything that is wrong with you and, and offer you salvation that will permanently cure your biggest problems then just deal with all these symptoms that will never deal with the true issue of your heart. And so maybe as we ask ourselves the question, why didn't Jesus bring earth back to perfection? I believe we can draw back to the line because Jesus said, if I do that, I'll never have the opportunity to be able to let them see their true need, and that is a restored relationship with me, to have their sins forgiven, find redemption, in a home in heaven for all of eternity. Why did Jesus have so much compassion on those that he endured encountered? It is simply because he understood at the bottom of all of these issues in their life is a heart that needs to be forgiven and redeemed. Why did Jesus show so much animosity towards evil and self-righteous hypocrites? It is simply because he knew that at the bottom of all of that, it was cloaking the, 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 the major issue that was at the heart, a heart that needs to be redeemed i ask you at the beginning of the message today how do you know how do you get to know a person we we may have uh, in your life encountered a time where you discovered that a person you thought was somebody turns out to be not that person right you thought of them one way and then when you get to know them it's completely the opposite of that right one of the earliest experiences of that in my lifetime uh, was not an experience I had, but was an experience a friend had, uh, where they were at a, at a golf tournament trying to get a signature from Tiger Woods. Um, uh, Tiger Woods, if you don't know, he's a, a, a phenomenal golfer. He's won a lot of golf, gone through a lot in his life, and uh, is, a, is a great example of a person that has and had everything you'd ever want, but was lacking the peace of God in his life. And I still think that's the case. That man, well, let me get back to the moral of the story. Uh, growing up, Tiger Woods. I mean, that was. I mean, he was the superstar. He, he was untouchable. It seemed like, and you just assume that he's a pretty good guy. You know, he's a respectable person. Well, my friend went and was trying to get an autograph from him. He hands Tiger Woods the hat and the pen that he wanted him to sign it. Tiger Woods signs it, walks a few feet away, and just throws the hat into the crowd and it did not make it back to the person that had bought the hat had spent the time to try to get the autograph and put the effort in and from that day forward my friend could care less about what tiger woods does on a golf field golf tournament golf course there, there's the word but then once you live a few years you begin to discover that 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 reality is more common than it is to find out somebody was who you thought they were, right? It's more common to be disappointed in somebody than to be satisfied. And I say all that to just bring this back to this question about who is Jesus? We know who we think he is. We think he's the son of God. We think he was born there of Mary and Nazareth, as we mentioned. We think he was the one that went to the cross and died. We think he's the one that rose again three days later miraculously. 
But when you really get to know Jesus and you really examine the day-to-day events of his life and as you examine his interaction with your own life and you see all these things we've mentioned today, you're not going to be disappointed in what you find. You're going to have your faith more solidified and that you understand Jesus is far more than I could have ever hoped for him to be. That takes a lifetime of learning. That takes some disappointments. That takes some heartache. It takes some hard questions, some confusing times, some disappointing times. But the more you investigate who Jesus is, the more you'll understand that, man, sure, he he is the all-supreme being. He has the authority to do whatever he wants to do, but he controls it according to his own will. But in so doing, never fails to show his compassion, never fails to oppose evil, and never fails to get off course of the main mission of redeeming us and preparing us for all of eternity. I think one thing that's interesting about this passage, and I say this and then I'll close, is that the people of Capernaum were often confused about Jesus, who he was and why he was there. The people of Nazareth were confused over who Jesus was and why he was there. But there's one main character in this story who was not confused and who knew, and it was the demon. The demon did not have any problems believing that Jesus was exactly who Jesus said he would be. And I trust today that we'll fall in alignment with that and just not have any problems believing that Jesus was who he said he was.